So I'm Claudio Scordino from Evidence. Uh, unfortunately, Yuri uh, is in the process of uh, uh, switching companies, so he asked me to, to do this uh, presentation. I'm not such a good speaker as Yuri, but uh, I will try to illustrate uh, all the things uh, that are going on uh, SCAD deadline and uh, starting from the ones that have been uh, recently merged. So I've divided uh, this presentation in some phases, I would say. Uh, in the first uh, stage, I will, uh, I will uh, briefly recall how the, the new uh, algorithm of uh, SCAD deadline works, the one that has been uh, just merged. Then I will, uh, I will illustrate uh, some uh, ongoing uh, features and uh, finally some others that are under discussion and uh, probably also the most important. So bandwidth reclaiming. Uh, the problem was that sometimes a real-time task needs more bandwidth than the one that has been allocated uh, through its reservation. And maybe the system is not fully loaded, so we have some spare bandwidth that uh, we could give uh, to, the, to the task. Uh, this happens, for example, in some, in some systems, uh, uh, like uh, if we want to handle network traffic or rendering of uh, particularly heavy frames. The solution that has been envisioned is uh, the, uh, the bandwidth reclaiming. So hollow task to consume uh, more than allocated, but still under some constraints, like uh, up to a certain maximum uh, fraction of uh, CPU time, because uh, we don't want to experience a starvation of uh, low priority tasks. And uh, if uh, this doesn't break, of course, the real-time guarantees of the other uh, real-time tasks. The algorithm that has been merged is called the GRAB, which stands for Greedy Reclamation of a New Set Bandwidth, and replaces uh, the constant bandwidth server, which was the algorithm that uh, was implemented previously, developed uh, mainly by Scuola Santana with the collaboration of Evidence and ARM. And uh, it's already uh, mainline, and uh, uh, there is a pretty good documentation already there in case you want to, to have a look at it. I will try very briefly to give you an idea of how it works. Mainly, a uh, uh, SCAD deadline task can be in uh, three states. Uh, the first state is uh, called the active contending, uh, which is uh, when the task is uh, ready for execution, it's not blocked. Instead, we have two different states uh, for uh, a blocked task, which are called active and non-contending and inactive. The idea is that uh, the task stays inactive, non-contending, if uh, we cannot uh, reclaim its bandwidth without breaking uh, the real-time guarantees. As soon as we can reclaim its bandwidth, the uh, task enters the inactive state. So uh, this is very trivial. Uh, when a task blocks, uh, it enters the active non-contending. After a certain amount of time, there is a timer firing. Uh, we call it a zero lag timer. And the task enters the inactive, uh, the inactive uh, state. Uh, we account for the bandwidth of all active uh, tasks uh, in the run queue, which is called running bandwidth in the code. And uh, we also account for the total bandwidth on the run queue, which is called this bandwidth. Let me make a simple example. Suppose task one should execute four milliseconds every eight milliseconds, but after two milliseconds, the task blocks. Then it enters the active non-contending state. After other two milliseconds, the zero lag timer fires, so the uh, task enters the inactive state, and the active bandwidth, uh, which is called the running bandwidth, is lowered. So uh, uh, the task two can execute for uh, more time if it had set 
the scared flag reclaim, which is a flag that allows to specify that the task can reclaim his uh, can reclaim the the bandwidth. And finally, we have some spare bandwidth uh, given by the real time limits to execute lower priority tasks like uh, SCEDADA. This is uh, the the formula that uh, we have used in the code. I'm not going to spend much time on this. You can look at it uh, in, uh, within the documentation. Anyway, it, uh, it includes uh, uh, several parameters like uh, uh, the real time limits and also the uh, utilization, the bandwidth of the whole run queue. So I'm not gonna spend uh, too much time on this. Uh, some experimental results taken from the uh, talk by Yuri at the ELC. Uh, suppose you have uh, two tasks. The first one uh, with a reservation of six milliseconds every 20 milliseconds, but uh, with a task that consumes just five milliseconds. So you can see that there is uh, some spare bandwidth here. And uh, task two, which experiences uh, some occasional variances in the, in the execution time. We have plotted the, the, the cumulative distribution function, which is the probability that the response time goes, uh, is less or equal to a certain value. And using uh, the original CBS, you see that 25% uh, of times the response times go uh, above the reservation period of the task too. Instead, using GRUB, you see that the uh, task uh, two always completes before the reservation period because uh, task two is using the uh, bandwidth uh, uh, left by task one. So uh, it's, it, it's easy to understand that in this sense, uh, the, the task can execute uh, for, for more time because task one is not using uh, its full uh, its full uh, reservation time. So this uh, concludes uh, what has been already merged in the mainline kernel in case you want to have a look at it. Uh, I will start now uh, um, telling some, uh, some uh, features that are under development uh, in, uh, within SCAD deadline. The first one is the integration with the SCAD util. Uh, currently, Schedutil, which is uh, the, um, the CPU frac governor um, binded to the, to the schedule, uh, currently Schedutil runs sched deadline tasks at the maximum CPU frequency. Our idea is to, is to extend Schedutil such that uh, instead of uh, reclaiming the bandwidth uh, to execute the task for a longer time, we reclaim the bandwidth to lower the CPU frequency while still meeting the, the real-time guarantees. The algorithm uh, taken from the literature is called GRUB-PA, where PA stands, uh, stands for Power Aware. And uh, uh, we already discussed uh, some design choices at the OSPM meeting uh, in April. Uh, these have been uh, the, the choices that uh, we discussed. The first one is uh, to use the, the active bandwidth uh, rather than the, the total bandwidth for frequency scaling. This means that uh, we have a more aggressive uh, energy efficiency. To use uh, the frequency uh, uh, at the moment of the runtime accounting, even if it's been already changed by other scheduling classes, because other scheduling classes are free to change the frequency, of course. And finally, the most discussed one was uh, to set the key thread to schedule deadline with a special flag, uh, with a special flag. Uh, we sent uh, the, the latest uh, RFC on July. We are, we are ready to submit a new version where we took into account uh, uh, some issues, uh, for example, about uh, priority inheritance, uh, which was broken uh, 
for a scared deadline uh, for the K thread that uh, didn't have a uh, bandwidth. It was a special, a special uh, scared deadline task, but uh, without bandwidth, so uh, it, uh, it gave problems uh, with priority inheritance. This has been fixed and uh, is fi will be fixed in the next uh, submission. Uh, these are some, uh, some experiments that uh, we have done. Actually, uh, we, we meant to present them at the, uh, the Linux kernel uh, workshop, but uh, uh, at the real-time workshop, but it was canceled. So but we already had uh, some, uh, some uh, values. And uh, uh, we have run uh, some experiments on a four-core uh, IMX6 changing uh, the, the period and changing uh, the reservation values uh, for understanding how it performs uh, <coughs> versus uh, the uh, current schedule and uh, also versus the performance uh, governor. We have taken the, the tip three for, uh, for, an, uh, for a comparison of the, of the um, consumption. As uh, you can see in the first, in the first uh, column, uh, we have run uh, one single reservation, changing re the runtime from 10 milliseconds to 100 of milliseconds, and a period of 100 milliseconds. And inside the reservation, we have put a one scale deadline task with a period of 100 milliseconds. And 90% of the runtime was 90% of the reservation runtime. As you can see, we have a uh, much lower energy uh, consumption than using schedule or uh, performance. And also the number of deadline misses is experienced by the, by the task is uh, uh, more or less a zero, especially when compared uh, um, with respect to schedule. Then we have run the same uh, the same uh, experiments, this time uh, using 100% of the reservations runtime. And of course, in this case, we have a higher number of deadline misses, but again, uh, the number of deadline misses uh, with Grab PA is much lower than you using a Schedutil, and the consumption is still below, uh, at least for, uh, for values of the bandwidth lower than 70%. We also have tested the, 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 same, uh, the same kind of uh, uh, task uh, using a 10 milliseconds uh, reservation uh, period for the reservation and the task. And finally, using uh, one reservation per core uh, with one task in, in each reservation. So uh, these experimental results uh, show that uh, we can uh, lower the, the frequency, still meeting the, the, um, the, the uh, still meeting the deadlines, uh, and uh, we always get better better uh, values than using uh, the schedule, the normal schedule um, uh, governor. Yeah, I, I have a. I, I don't need to eat the thing, right? Um, almost. Almost. So, there the blue lines are actually higher than the yellow lines. Bottom row, third yeah, from the left. Here, yeah. for values of the bandwidth, uh, higher. No, than the the bottom. So percentage of deadline misses, and then one, one yeah. more. Yeah, here, here. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. That yeah. don't look good. Yeah, yeah. We still have to, 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 to do further investigation about why for, uh, for 10 milliseconds. I, I will talk about uh, the, 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 the 10 milliseconds in, in, the, in the next slide. But yeah, yeah we, we have seen this, uh, this. But if you compare, yeah, that's the only case where it uh, performed uh, uh, worse than uh, than uh, schedule, but if you look at the schedule, yeah, here schedule doesn't perform well, uh, even for low values of the of the band. What we have noticed 
is that if, when the, uh, the granularity of time for, uh, for the period is, uh, is uh, of the same order of magnitude of the, of the time to switch uh, the frequency, uh, we, start exp uh, we start experiencing uh, uh, the, um, the deadline misses. Uh, in particular, we have uh, run some, uh, some uh, tests on uh, Odroid uh, XU4, which is a, a big little system, which takes uh, more than three milliseconds for doing the frequency switch. And uh, if uh, we use uh, 10 milliseconds period, we start experimenting a, a lot of uh, deadline misses. So uh, we, we, we have thought about how to mitigate this, uh, this, uh, this uh, yeah. So you're saying 3.5 milliseconds for a frequency switch, so is the CPU doing nothing in that time and waiting for the frequency to settle or what? Oh, uh, it seems that it's doing nothing. It's not executing the real-time task. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the, this time is not just hardware. It's uh, the whole driver uh, starting uh, the frequency switch and looking at the tables. And I, I, I suppose that uh, most of the time is hardware, but uh, there is uh, also a bit of uh, hovered by the, the driver for yeah. choosing the, the frequency and doing but if it's stuff. if it's more than a few microseconds then the driver should be rewritten <laughs> so from what I understand the, the main problem of switching frequencies on on the simple arms is that all the regulator stuff is behind an I squared C bus right which yeah. means you need scheduling in order to change the frequency, but we're driving it from the scheduler, yay. Um, <coughs> supposedly there are um, newer parts with a mailbox interface to a firmware where you can actually change or put in requests. But yeah, the, the, the longest time I think is settling of the frequency. The, the chip will run, but you're not exactly sure at what rate. Um, or at least that's, that's my understanding of it. So the CPU does not stall. It just takes time to settle on the new voltage or frequency. Yep. Yep. And in these cases, uh, we, we uh, experience a very high amount of uh, deadline misses because, of course, uh, you have a very short deadline and a uh, very early deadline. And, uh, you, you, you are losing maybe time to trying to, to adjust the frequency. Maybe in these cases, it would be more appropriate to remain at the same frequency and trying to, to meet the deadline. Anyway, we have uh, tried to mitigate this fact by uh, ignoring the rate limit. Uh, you know, there is uh, this rate limit uh, which prevents uh, too often changes of the frequency of the frequency scaling. So ignoring this rate limit when we have an urgent request from SCAD deadline to increase the, the frequency. And also buffering uh, urgent requests arriving when the key thread is in progress. Because if the key thread is in progress, maybe lowering the frequency from a previous uh, request, if you arrive in that moment, uh, your request uh, will not be handled uh, just when it has finished, but it will be handled uh, later on. Right, so, so if I remember Raphael and, and I don't know who, either Morton or something, uh, they want to put in a max filter. Uh, so so um, whilst the thing is in progress or over the, the rate limit period, find the maximum request and program that the moment uh, you, you, you go mm -hmm. in again. Um, lowering is not that important, but you want to, to yep. raise, yeah. Um, yeah, and anyway, with both uh, these, uh, these uh, options enabled, we still have uh, uh, too, too, too high number of, uh, 
of deadline misses. Yeah, so, I mean, if it takes three and a half millis. Yeah, 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 to, it can not affect be, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the only solution we, we came out is uh, to, uh, to start using <laughs> the, the total bandwidth uh, rather than the active bandwidth. In that case, uh, you wouldn't have any, any frequency switch. Uh, you wouldn't need it. But uh, of course, uh, you, you lose in terms of uh, energy efficiency. So uh, the first question of my presentation is, uh, would be a knob in CS uh, file, file system to select the kind of uh, uh, bandwidth to be used would be a viable solution. Should we default to using this bandwidth rather than running bandwidth? W what do you think? I'm not sure on sys, but a knob might be okay. Um, the default, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on the platform, I think, because yeah. if you've got a non-sucky platform, this might all work lots better. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you have uh, other, other opinions or comments about how to handle this, uh, this uh, scenario, just, just let me know, of course. So another feature under development, uh, this is mostly by, by Scuola Santana, is the hierarchical or group scheduling. I will try to say something and then Tommaso will correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, the first RFC has been sent on March uh, by Scuola Santana on the uh, mailing list and uh, uh, it consisted of three pages, uh, uh, quite big actually. And the idea is that uh, we have uh, um, the first level which, uh, which is a SCAD deadline and then uh, the second level you can have a FIFO or for example other uh, SCAD deadline tasks and so on. And the idea is that uh, this uh, could uh, eventually replace uh, real-time throttling. They have also provided, uh, in the same submission, an example of usage uh, through uh, the C groups. And, uh, and uh, the behavior is that if we have uh, a task with runtime 10 milliseconds and the period 100 milliseconds, the task is allowed to execute 10 milliseconds on every CPU. Uh, at the moment, it's unclear how to proceed with this. Uh, if uh, the community prefers a different API or a different behavior, or if the community prefers uh, uh, to focus on uh, more urgent features of SCAD deadline. So uh, the development here is stalled. So what do you think? Yeah, this has been going on for quite a while. The, the problem is, um, is, is affinities, um, <laughs> as you know. So charging every CPU in the system for a group works, but is very pessimistic. Um, charging, uh, the, the other approach is, is um, a minimum concurrency which is good for packing, but does not deal with tasks that have arbitrary affinity, because then the affin task affinity is dictated by the, the uh, deadline scheduler and not by the um, FIFO tasks running within. Um, and, and it's not clear to me how we can um, bridge that or, or what is actually desired by people who want, or, yeah, want to use this. Um, The, the per CPU um, reservation is, is very, very pessimistic. Yep. So I can see people not wanting to use that because it's just um, too pessimistic. Um, 
but people are too used to using affinities for FIFO tasks to readily use minimal concurrency. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to go forward on this. Um, to one, keep FIFO behavior and two, build something that is actually a real-time system. I mean, we can fudge it, of course, <laughs> but that, that um, doesn't make anybody happy, I think. So, yeah, I don't know. The miser one. Yeah, one, two. yeah uh, so uh, basically, so the, the answer to your question would be we have arbitrary affinity, which is really a big, big uh, stopper for this, for this item. Okay, so a question is, uh, um, uh, what if we uh, can work around this affinity problem. Uh, I mean, the, is, the, is the scenario you, are, you have in mind, you say people are used into this affinity stuff, is the scenario with the, you know, single CPU affinities? Or, uh, so is there just the need for mixing like single CPU affinities with system-wide uh, no pin down tasks? Or is, is, does it go more complex? That would be useful to know more about. Can I make my point? I think that we already support uh, arbitrary affinities for the FIFO and not supporting it inside uh, the deadline would be a break. So we should, uh, we should be able to schedule arbitrary affinities before making it possible. Um, so, so let me first answer or try to answer uh, Tom, uh, Tommaso. Um, I think most of the, the proper real-time tasks only use single CPU affinity. However, since we've allowed it, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of software out there that tries to be cute. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I really don't know. Um, if we can disallow FIFO to use anything other than, than um, single, the, it, it'll, people will complain, I think. It'd be awesome to do, but <laughs> and the patch will be really, really simple. <laughs> but the fallout will be massive, I'm afraid. And then, Thomas, do you know of any sane real-time program that uses arbitrary overlapping affinities? Mm. That's uh, the wrong question, because I do not know about any sane real-time programs to begin with. <laughs> No, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem is I know only a few uh, actual use cases, and there the affinities are sane because I told them or teach those people to make them sane. Affinities and, 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 and real-time priorities and, and all these kind of things. But people do a lot of fancy stuff out there. And, I mean, if you look at the, at the, at the reports uh, which come in on RT users, uh, you know what people are doing or trying to do. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the stuff out there, we we all know that is just do, done by oh, let's assign some random priority, see what breaks, and then try again. And uh, after a while, you have a set of priority settings. You don't know why it works, but it works. Yeah, this is the, the what's it? That's the genome uh, or. or G genetic programming, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... Okay, so so basically, to to take our, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one one possibility could be to, uh, or, or at least uh, something we 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 have in mind is to, on one hand, to try to just you know maintain this for a little while, but just for, you know, experimentation purposes. Uh, so, for example, we have already a rebase on the 4th, 13th, something. Uh, I think it was actually TipsCAD, uh, maybe TipsCAD core, uh, just made a few days ago. And so, so one thing you could do is to preserve some of the, the work you did, um, is uh, explicit slack time scheduling for CFS. This is something that Bjorn also asked for many years ago, and that is something that, that could be trivially done with much of the infrastructure that you have here. You mean nesting, uh, yeah, nesting CFS inside the SCAD deadline application? 
Right. Any, any yeah. yeah. Uh, how about just thinking not as a SCAD deadline, but uh, about reservations per CPU? And inside these reservations, we schedule like uh, the CFS and the RT. It's not this deadline scheduler, it would be just a, a way to provide fairness, but the reservations. Think on reservations to substitute the RT throttling, and not the throttling, but uh, providing bandwidth for CFS, inverting that, the that, story. That's exactly that's, uh, what's that kind of schedule. OK. Well, uh, OK, so that, that could be something useful to prototype. Right, but that would be some, something that would be invasive in the overall scheduling infrastructure. So, right, so you would end up touching. Or how would that relate with bandwidth control in CFS then? Um. Yeah. So the idea is, is as um, Daniel already said, is to replace the the RT throttle um, with an explicit reservation for CFS. So. Um, you simply schedule CFS to run in your 5% um, default reservation. And then if there isn't anything else to run, it'll run whatever other uh, deadline tasks or, or, or real-time ta uh, FIFO tasks there are. Um, and that way you avoid the starvation uh, issues um, on CFS that, that your default while one 5099 task has. Um, because the deadline will override that and, and provide CFS some bandwidth. So it's, it's a bandwidth provision. It's, it's basically what, what uh, yeah. Uh, just a few last words. So what, what we are planning to work on, or maybe we, uh, yes, some of these we're already working on, but so uh, basically, uh, uh, okay, on one hand, uh, together with Daniels, uh, we, we are, and with that, we are actually looking at this completely, you know, semi-partitioning uh, scheduler that is a, a, a completely different way of dealing with this uh, affinities problem that we have currently in SCAD deadline, uh, albeit, so in that way, we would kill the, the global uh, EDF part of the, of the SCAD deadline. Uh, or if it makes any sense, we can still recover it. <laughs> it doesn't look like so. So th that's one, one line, but it's still a uh, prototyping stage. Uh, another line we have at the moment uh, is to uh, uh, keep going with this bandwidth inheritance problem, so tackling better this uh, you know, priority inheritance when you have these reservations. So what happens there along with use of RT mutexes? and how to deal that properly in multi-course. Uh, and uh, other things we are uh, dealing, uh, we are uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, we are working on is uh, on power management, so it's related to group PA, but uh, for these heterogeneous platforms like Big Little, and so we plan to, to have something on that line as well shortly, so uh, like some policy or maybe integration to the EAS, Energy Aware or Scheduling Framework by ARM or something in that line to deal with SCAD deadline tasks properly over these heterogeneous platforms. Uh, that looks like uh, quite a pain at the moment. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, so those are more or less the upcoming uh, things. Uh, yeah. Uh, now that Daniel, I don't know. I'm will, not sure if you have also some further slides. Yeah, Daniel uh, will uh, will. Uh, yeah, maybe Daniel, you have something on, semi on the semi-partitions. Yeah, there are some slides. Yeah. Get me to. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I welcome you to present uh, the semi-partition and schedule. Okay. Yeah. Hey, special guest. Yeah. I wasn't ready to present. <laughs> so. It's a real-time presentation. Yeah, that's a real, real-time presentation. Real-time decision. So the same partition scheduler that we were discussing here. What is the idea? There are some use, use cases in which, uh, which it, we have a, a schedulable task set, like uh, we can place these three tasks to run on two CPUs, but neither global or partition scheduler are able to schedule these tasks because they have the same deadline here. So if I put, I cannot place this task here, neither here, or if I put it first, I would miss this task deadline. There are current cases, but they exist. So it's not feasible neither with global 
or with partition, which are the options that we have now on the SCAD deadline. So what does the academic world have to say about this? Uh, Bjorn Brandenburg, which is a researcher in Germany, and Gil, they made a paper last year showing that by using a semi-partition scheduler, they can be almost, uh, they can be nearly optimal. Optimal in the sense that they can schedule uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, task set which is able to find a schedule, it is able to find the schedule as well. So usually they can schedule 99% of the utilization or the CPU using this same partition uh, approach. The point of this paper here we cannot just apply this to Linux because this, they reach this value only if they know on beforehand all the workload that they have to schedule. They know on beforehand, run a lot of uh, heuristics, and then they, they find how to split tasks among the processors and uh, make the schedule. So it's not a, 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 we cannot apply this to Linux because we don't know the workload on beforehand. So, you know, in one way to provide um, uh, an online way to do this, that is, in one way to use the same partition approach, but for a task set that you don't know on beforehand, these guys from Italy, from the Scuola Superior di Santana, where I'm studying, Tommaso and the Claudio is from, too, uh, they simplified this approach and created a semi partition uh, online scheduler or approach based on this work, but relax it to be able to do the computation online while running, taking decisions while running, and while receiving new tasks that we don't know. So how good is this online same partition scheduler? Compared to the, to the this line is the global scheduler. And uh, these three lines are heuristics for partition, like I separate each CPU and try to place tasks on that CPUs not migrating. And this up line here is the, is the work present on this paper. So compared to the global, global in the worst case, it can schedule like a half of the CPU time. While with this new approach, we can schedule like 94% of the CPU time. And comparing to the heuristics for the, for the partition, like we, here we have a 61, 62% of CPU time. Why with the partitioning, simple partitioning, we can reach like 87, almost 90% of CPU time. Which is like, a, it's not optimal, we, we do not reach the 100%, but it's, uh, it takes, I think it takes 100% of our Linux users. Because Linux users would not place 100% of CPU time in SCAD deadline tasks. And we also need to have some time, spare time to run, for example, the bandwidth inheritance. So we need to have some time to some spare time there to be used. So on our opinion, this, this, is, this is pretty close to the optimum for Linux. So more or less, how does it work? Uh, how could this algorithm, or how does a same partition uh, scheduler could resolve this problem? The, this is just a, an example, a simple example. First, it tries to pin the task to the CPUs, and then after pinning, when receive a task which is, it cannot place there, it changes a little bit the, the task, doing a period transformation uh, risk, which says that, okay, how much time do I have here? I have three units of time, so I will put three of the four units of time here, and I will reduce the deadline of this, part, this partition of this reservation. Reducing by the, the time that is left. I still need to run for one unit of time. So I reduce this by one in, unit of time and place the rest on the other CPU in which it, fix, it fits. So I make a reservation of the CPU, like a CBS reservation, of one unit of time with a deadline of one. Uh, and the period will be the same. The period is the same. So. Voila, we can schedule this task set in this way. And this is more or less how it works. Like they have more heuristics, but this is a simplified version. Question? Okay, sure. That's the idea. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, if you schedule it this way, then you need to account for the uh, transfer of the data of the task to another CPU. If those two CPUs are on the uh, uh, hyperthreads of the single one, then it is not so big problem. So basically, then it is not big problem. But at the moment, when you start to move the task to another real core, then you need to put into your heuristic quite complex nonlinear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, the point is that in a comparison of the global scheduling with this, the same partition schedule, in the global scheduler, they do way more migrations. And under partition the scheduler, we can have uh, at, at most M migrations, M tasks migrating. So we reduce the number of migrations of the tasks. Actually, it's better on the migration. Then it's the question if it is not better to ask the application to basically define which part should is uh, least connected to another part that the migration has lowest cost. So basically the application should somehow make the system aware that now it, it is in the area where the migration cost is not so big because you usually compute with some big bat matrices and so on and then you have some relatively narrow path from one part of the algorithm to another one. So it is more complex to ask, I think. Here you're assuming applications actually know what the heck they're doing. <laughs> this is false. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, the point is that we can, we can even mitigate this with a, a simple thing from Linux. For example, on the global scheduler, we would have migrations and we don't, we cannot, okay, Stephen has a question. Finish your thought, I don't want to leave the slide. Sorry? Finish your thought, but I want to talk about the slide. Oh, okay, yeah. So, okay, we have more control over, mi over migrations, and I will say something later, but I will, okay, I will say it now. Using this way, we can enable arbitrary affinities, and so if you want a test to not migrate, you just need to set the affinity to one CPU, and then you avoid. That's one way. Or we can even add a flag saying, please don't migrate. But, yeah, okay, he didn't say no, it's, it's a good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a question about the um, uh, the one one nine, um, because that's basically saying uh, the deadline is a one. Um, I'm surprised. Why is it? Does it have to be one one? Because I was looking at this. I'm like, it would work if you even had it as one nine nine, right there. Uh, for this, because once it migrates over, you're saying it immediately has to run. Yeah, uh, but in these cases, we are, okay, in the heuristics, it's known that there is a space for this task here. For example, uh, we know that if we have just one task here, it will have uh, three spare times. If it has three spare times, I can use one immediately. It will push at max one unit of time. So basically, uh, you would need, of course, a, more, a complex test here to be exact, which is called the DBF, demand bound function. So that's the test that we would need theoretically to answer exactly whether we can schedule this kind of stuff there. So, we, okay, this is a very easy example. If you pick a little bit more elaborate, I mean, the test is complex and the, in its time. So what we've actually seen with these heuristics results that also Daniel uh, showed uh, earlier, uh, this heuristic uh, is a simplified version of the DBF that doesn't consider the full DBF test, but it considers only the first few points and then it makes a linear approximation of what would be this DBF function. Uh, so uh, it's uh, so that's why it, it it's not uh, completely uh, it's not really uh, completely uh, the same, but it, it gives us uh, sufficiently good results as shown by this uh, you know random task sets we've been generating and stuff. Is it happy about 119 there? Uh, in this, it has to be one one nine. Yes, and. Uh, 1 8. No, the, the problem is that if you make it 1 8, so the first task over there, there's no guarantee it will actually be scheduled that way as shown in the picture. So, in the worst case, you basically the 389 task may be scheduled just, you know, 
uh, it may tend at time eight. Right. That's, the, that's the, its actual worst case, that on the first CPU, the task would end at, at eight times slot. So in that yeah, case, yeah. Uh, it has to be one one, so that when it migrates, it gets scheduled immediately. No. There, there's a, uh, by the way, there's a paper explaining all these decisions here. Show the link for the paper. Uh, show the link for the paper. So, but no, the reason why I'm saying that is, okay, you subtracted the one from. Okay, it was originally four nine nine, correct? So you subtracted one from the deadline. Uh, so um, the artificial. So you. So yeah. Well, actually, you took the real deadline and you subtracted one from it to make an artificial deadline for how much you need to put on another CPU. Now, considering we had a full, um, what's it called? a perfect migration scheduler. So basically you had a migration overhead of zero. That's just our you know, perfect world uh, ponies. Uh, if ideally then I could still see it still making it because you subtracted it. So when it switches over, it's got the next deadline. It would be, I said it would be one, nine, nine, but nines were coming up right away. So it would have to schedule right away then anyway. So that's my question is why does it have I don't see the reason why it's got to be 1-1 one, one here still. That's, well, I guess I have to read the paper to see a more complex case because this is not a case where that's required. Okay, uh, this is just a simple example, but this is a heuristic which is known to be good for a partition. And they have a paper showing that that's a good uh, heuristic and they were able to reach these 99% using this. Yeah. I think that the, the original paper C equals to D is from Alan Burns, isn't it? Yeah, that's the C equals to Alan Yeah, it's from Alan Burns. It's a well-known researcher. Like. So, your, yeah. So, the same partition scheduler, it's still a work in progress. I'm working with uh, Professor Tommaso. He's my PhD advisor. That's why I must have uh, agreed with him always. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so it changed how the deadline scheduler deal with multiprocessors, but it's not a new scheduler. We are just uh, changing how the SCAD deadline works. Uh, when an, uh, a task switches to deadline, these heuristics will select where to put the tasks and how to split it if needed. One thing is that in the most of the cases, there will be no split of tasks, and tasks will be pinned to the processors. We just need to split when we are reaching a very high overload, a uh, uh, very high load. So in the most of the time, tasks are pinned to processors, and so we are avoiding migrations at all. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, just to be fair, as the heuristic, the placement heuristic sometimes cannot really find room for a new task that is coming later. So in that case, at the moment, we, we, we move like just one. I think it, it's in the current heuristic. We try to move just one of the already placed tasks. So in, get, in that case, it would undergo migration. So just, it, it can be still placed you know, on a single CPU, but it can, be, it can be changed later as new tasks are coming. So this is a heuristic. So of course, there's plenty of work, of space to improve it, to you know, reason about to see what's best really for Linux or for specific use cases. But uh, yeah, so that was just to clarify that you know, once you're pinned down on a CPU, maybe you could have to move later to make room for others. So it's there's still. This. But the good point is that the, such decisions for migration aren't to take place, for example, in the pool uh, way. Uh, they are or in the runtime. It's just when you accept a new task with uh, the, the syscall. So we reduce the complexity of the runtime scheduler, the runtime. And uh, okay, we don't on the SCAD deadline. We currently have uh, entities, deadline entities. In this case, we still have the entity, but we will not schedule the entity. We will schedule reservations. Like this, this is one reservation. And this is another reservation. So one task can can have. A, one or more reservations, and we schedule the reservations, not the entity. So the benefits are our RT problems are reduced to single core. 
There are two parts of the real-time uh, theory. We have the single core, which is from 60s, and they are very stable, and everything runs in a simpler way. And we have optimal solutions. Or we have the moot core, which is known to be harder. We have some anomalies. We have some cases which we know it's not possible to be optimal at all. So we reduce all the problems to single core, which is very good from the, from the theoretical standpoint. The heuristics are set only when we switch the, uh, the priority, or when we change the affinity of the tasks, or when we have hot plugs. So we have a least runtime overhead, and the overhead is more on these operations, which are known to not be, not be real time. We, we are expecting to have latencies here. It's not a problem to have latencies here. So there is no need to pull tasks. We just push tasks, and this reduces a lot of the the time which we held the RQ lock, which is good, mainly a remote lock, so we can have a we can reduce the latency for RT tasks, for example, running on other lock if you have to migrate. And um, okay, okay, tasks are mostly pinned into CPU. Our finites come for free because we can just uh, change the the heuristics, which is simple. And this is a real problem if you try to resolve this. Uh, as a, in the global scheduler. There's one paper mentioned this. The paper has a lot of correction. It's very complex to understand. And uh, the current status is that, yeah, we are seeing the, the, the theoretical results in the reality, which is good. It's, it's not always like this, what we are seeing. But it's still in a work in progress. We are working on a paper about it. And uh, the points to be discussed are in, in this case, we need to run the admission control in the kernel, not in delegating it to user space. We could delegate it to user space, but then we would have to change the API. And I think, and I say to Tommaso, if you want to change the API, I will send the patch with from Tommaso Cucinota, not from me. I don't want to hear about changing API. <laughs> and uh, okay, this this is a change. And currently, we don't have the admission. <laughs> we we currently don't have that uh, like uh, we have an admission control. It provides uh, not deadline but um, a bounded lateness, uh, bounded lateness, tardness, tardness. And uh, so we we will have to do this. But uh, well, actually, that that's a. a that's a change in the way that we do, but it's to avoid changing the API. And uh, well, the current the current design does not consider implicit deadline tasks, but the current scheduler it it was like a, a relaxed way to accept the tasks, but uh, actually there are cases in which we missed the deadline. So uh, we don't consider still don't consider implicit deadlines, but the current scheduler doesn't consider that in the like it formally like uh, papers like to do so uh, we are having we are facing the same problem and okay that's that's over I'm sorry oh, uh, I no I don't need any comment from the API thinking Admission control. Yeah, that that makes things very nasty. If you, if you want to, is, is it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's on. Right. So so pushing it out to user space gets you a whole bunch of problems because then there might be multiple clients or multiple different clients or. It's this. It's a mess. Um, so first, let's see how horrible the the um, in kernel admission control is um, before we start considering other things. Um, but as is the the admission control, yes, it is simple, but it it does um, provide the bounded tardiness um, even for implicit. It just doesn't provide. Um, uh, the no deadline misses on UP, I think. In this case, it's, in this case, it's not found in but it's like in warranty. Right. Warranty. So, so how horrible... It's not a simple heuristic that has to be considered. 
basically it's going to be complex. So yeah, so, so how, how horrible is it? Just to give you an example, you first place a task without any affinity constraint, you place it somewhere, then later it comes another task with an affinity constraint exactly on that CPU. You may have to kick the former one you know, to a different one. So it's not just admission control, just to clarify, this is like you know, relocating stuff around. And of course, you know, if you want to make it exact, it's gonna take time and be complex and uh, it, And uh, when we change affinities, and when we hot plug operations, this, this must be done in kernel. And, and, and we're not talking multiple seconds, right? It's just some computation. Yeah. No, 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 we're not in the seconds range. We, we could be in the milliseconds range too at the moment. It depends on the load, on the SCAD that I load on the system, which is maybe expected to be low, so no problem. Uh, one thing could be that if you change uh, another task's uh, affinity, on, uh, sorry, affinity, but I mean the temporary, this internal temporary, the CPU where it's placed, uh, you may want to do it when it's not running. So maybe you could, so you could either, okay, either you force migration while it's running and you do it now, or you wait for it to be, uh, you know, get, go to sleep. And, and that takes time. So, so the scenario that would care, I suppose, is this adaptive stuff that you guys have been doing. Yeah. If it's good enough for that, I, I assume it's good enough. Because the adaptive stuff wants to very frequently readjust um, parameters. Oh, but it returns to the implicit deadline tasks. Even though we, we don't have uh, results for implicit deadline tasks now, we know that it's impossible, for example, to be optimal on an online implicit deadline test on multi core. But that's not, that turns easier when you use a single core theory. And we base on single core. So it will be easier than trying to fix this in the, as global. Oh, well, uh, you can keep it. I have mine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I would just mention other features that uh, have been discussed uh, uh, in the past. One of those uh, was uh, the reclaiming by the motion, uh, which was uh, mentioned uh, last year at the real-time summit and uh, requested uh, probably by the Android group. Uh, we have a patch available on top of group scheduling, so uh, I have no idea if uh, this is a patch uh, which is uh, still needed uh, or it has been superseded by the fact that the Grub algorithm can reclaim. So, uh, I don't know if Peter wants to add something about this. Peter. Uh, do you think uh, um, it's still important to have a reclaiming by the motion or Grub has uh, superseded this, uh, this need? So yeah, it, it's something that is fairly frequently requested and it shouldn't be too hard to do, I think. Um, I don't know, um, show me a patch, see how horrible it is. Um, the signal thing is also something that people yep. have asked for. Yeah. It should not be hard. I think the initial yeah. patches actually yeah, have, already it. have it. It's a few yeah. lines to just, yep. we just killed it because it wasn't absolutely necessary for the initial thing, yeah. so we stripped yeah. everything out. But. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, if people want it, we, we can we can certainly look at doing it. Um, okay, good. Uh, then there are, there is, oh, sorry. So on one of your very first slides, I had this question that kind of might go to this. The In your initial example of what Grub was, you had two tasks, um, and task A, I, I think, ran for a little bit, went to sleep, Task B was running, yeah, and it it went into its overtime and kept running, right? If task A, this one, yeah. So in the dotted line, yep, the dotted space, he's he's over budget. Um, yep. you're you're giving him extra time. Yep. If task A wakes up at that point, does he get control? 
does it get informed about what uh, about the the fact that he has lost uh, his well pet? so task one now becomes unblocked task two is in sort of overtime state does task one get control here oh uh, when task one uh, resumes uh, and he's in the inactive uh, inactive uh, state it uh, it gets a new uh, a new uh, period of time, so it, um, the runtime and the, and the period start from that moment. So it it will not have the deadline here, but it's recompted. So it will be at uh, if, uh, for example, uh, task one starts at five. Then it, it, it enters the active contending state, and the new deadline will be 5 plus 8, so 13. Mm. So that's how the, the algorithm works. So it will, be, uh, uh, it, uh, will have a deadline which is more or less here. Yeah, that's, that's part of the, uh, Similar to what CBS did. That's uh, okay. The one thing is the sched deadline isn't true like earliest deadline first because of the uh, constant bandwidth scheduler. Um, the constant bandwidth scheduler modifies the deadlines and periods depending so by the uh, percentage when it wakes up. And that's where I believe the zero lag is. Once you hit the zero lag, that means that if it wakes up at this point, it's going to be reset to uh, whatever. So it's not really a true earliest deadline first. And there's been bugs that yep. you know Daniel's been discovering and f kind of like whack-a-mole fixing uh, because of that. Uh, so uh, other, other features that are under discussion and that might be uh, the most important uh, and I've left uh, to the end so that Peter can, can say a word uh, later on, uh, unprivileged usage so the possibility of using uh, deadline uh, for, uh, without uh, the root privilege. And uh, finally, uh, the proxy ex execution or bandwidth inheritance uh, stuff. Uh, we, we had the first prototype of bandwidth inheritance made by Yuri a long time ago. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we have um, put it on, uh, revised it on a newer kernel but uh, we didn't have time for proper debugging and so on. And uh, Peter has uh, some new code, uh, and uh, the group in PISA, uh, Scola Santana and Evidence, uh, are willing to, to collaborate uh, on testing, uh, uh, development, and so on. So, uh, so uh, concluding, uh, um, schedule uh, integration is, uh, we think, is almost ready for mainline. We will uh, do a new submission in the next weeks. And uh, we have uh, solved uh, the problem uh, with the uh, priority inheritance that uh, uh, we have. And uh, we would like to figure out how to deal with uh, short periods on, uh, some, uh, on some platforms. And uh, we would like, among all the features that have been discussed, we would like to have a list of priorities uh, of uh, the most requested features so we don't waste time uh, on things that uh, nobody cares. Yeah, so, so like I said earlier, I'm not an RT user because I'm not actually a user. I don't use this stuff, I just work on it. Um, you use Windows. <laughs> no, I, I run Linux. Ah, okay. But I, I don't do much of deadline stuff uh, or, or real-time stuff other than, I mean, my editor is not a real-time process, is it? Um, and that's basically all I run. Um, the thing that I, I, I see requests for is, is the unprivileged use um, because then more user space can start using it. Then the media players, players can start using it. Um, Android can more easily use it or expose it to the apps and, and all the other stuff. Um, so I think that is one of the more important parts to, to get working. Um, that, of course, includes solving um, the bandwidth issue. Um, yeah, and if the, the, the various CBS fallback modes um, 
sending a signal or doing sh if people want it sure do a patch i don't yeah. don't particularly care if i mean if the patch is ugly i'll care um other than that not so much okay. um uh, can you go back one or two slides? There was some point that I wanted. Yeah. Um, oh. So single CPU affinity. If you do that without semi partition, we we end up at EasyDL or something like that. Um, the the thing I dreamt up in Dubrovnik. Um, um, that is with, with with a simpler admission control with uh, 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 some tardiness to be. Uh, right. So so I I presume because I don't know that that if people. Um, set single CPU affinity, they expect um, no deadline misses because this is what they know from EDF. Um, and for that to work in combination with the global stuff, you, you need a different scheduling policy, which is where the EZDL, where you mix le at least Laxity and, and EDF, are, are used to both the, the, the dual parameter space to prioritize between the, the local hard real-time and the global slightly softer real-time tasks. Which will be iffy. I know we, we talked about this. Um, so if I mean if if it all falls out of the semi partition, okay. If if we do it without the semi partition, it's going to be a bit uh, icky. I mean we can do it probably, but um, it's it's going to be more work. Yeah. The scheduling is going to be harder. The scheduling will be more complex. Yeah. So so the easy DL thing uh, where you where you mix the least laxity and and, and the earliest. Um, because there's two parameters in, 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 the, the, uh, in the space. We, we can use that to, to differentiate. Um, you were in Dubrovnik, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you've seen that. Um, yeah. But I, it, it turns out that you have a, like a two right. schedulers in one. Yeah, we, we were running late. I think Thomas wants me to, to yeah. hurry up. Um, but yeah. So I'll just say, my, pro my, my opinion is that we will turn one scheduler into two schedulers. No, 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 it's, it's just the one. It's, it's a bit icky. Um, <laughs> I can talk you through that again later. Um, Mike? Thank you very much. <laughs>